the last hour. Within the pavilion sat Alistair. She was clad in deep mourning, but her dress seemed disordered, as if by hasty travel. Her looks were full of anguish and terror. Her blanched dresses, once so dark and beautiful, hung dishevelled over her shoulders, and her thin hands were clasped in suffocation. Her cheeks were ashy pale, but on her brow was a bright red mark, as if traced by a finger dipped in blood. A lamp was burning on the table beside her. Near it was a skull, and near this emblem of mortality, an hourglass running fast. The windows and doors of the building were closed, and it would seem the unhappy lady was a prisoner. She had been brought there secretly that night with what intent she knew not, but she felt sure it was with no friendly design towards herself. Early in the day, three horsemen had arrived at her retreat in Pendle Forest, and without making any charge against her, or explaining whether they meant to take her, or indeed answering any inquiry, had brought her off with them, and proceeding across the country, had arrived at the forest's foot on the outskirts of Orton Park. Here they tarried till evening, placing her in a room by herself, and keeping strict watch over her, and when the shadows of night fell, they conveyed her through the woods, and by a private entrance to gardens of tower, and with equal secrecy to pavilion, where, setting a lamp before her, they left her to her meditation. All refused to answer her inquiries, but one of them, with a sinister smile, placed the hourglass and the soul beside her, let alone the wretched lady vainly sought some solution of the enigma why she had been brought thither. She could not solve it, but she determined her capture had been made by any lawful authorities to confess her guilt and submit to condign punishment. Though the windows and doors were closed, as before mentioned, sounds from without reached her, and she heard confused and tumultuous noises, as if from a large assemblage. For what purpose were they met? Could it be for her execution? No, there were strains of music and bursts of laughter, and yet she had heard that the burning of a witch was a speckle in which the populace delighted, and they looked upon it as a show like any other, and why should they not laugh and have music at it? But could she be executed without trial, without judgment? She knew not. All she knew was she was guilty and deserved to die. But when this idea took possession of her, the laughter sounded in her ears like the yells of demons and the strains like the fearful harmonies she had heard at weird sabbaths. All at once she recollected with indescribable terror that on this very night the compact she had entered into out of mind expired that at midnight and left by her penitence and prayers she had worked out her salvation he could claim her. She recollected also and with increased uneasiness that a man who had set her hourglass on the table and who had regarded her with a sinister smile as he did so had said it was eleven o'clock. Her last hour then had arrived. Nay, was partly spent at the moment passing swiftly by. The agony she endured at this thought was intense. She felt as if reason was forsaken her, and but for her determined efforts to resist it, such a crisis might have occurred. But she knew that her internal welfare depended upon the preservation of her mental balance, and she strove to maintain it, and in the end succeeded. Her gaze was fixed intently on the hourglass. She saw the sand trickling silently, but swiftly down like the current of life, which when it ceased, life would cease with it. She saw the shining grains of insensibly diminishing into nothing, and as if she could arrest her destiny by that, she seized the glass and would have turned it. But the folly of the proceeding arrested her, and she set it down again. Then horrible thoughts came upon her, crushing her and overwhelming her, and she felt by anticipation all the torments she would speedily have to endure. Oceans of fire in which miserable souls were forever tossing rolled before her. Yells such as no human anguish can produce smote her ears. Monsters of frightful form yawned to devour her. Fines armed with terrible implements of torture, such as the wildest imagination can paint menace her. All hell and its horrors was there, its dreadful gold, its roaring furnaces, its rivers of molten metal ever burning yet never consuming its victims. A hot sulfurous atmosphere oppressed her, and a film of blood in her sight. She endeavoured to pray with her tongue close to the roof of her mouth. She looked about for her Bible, but it had been left behind when she was taken from her retreat. She had no safeguard, none. Still, the sand ran on. New agonies assailed her. Hell was before her again, but in a new form and with new torment. She closed her eyes, she shut her ears, but she saw it still and heard its terrific yell. Again, she consults the hourglass. The sand is running on, ever diminishing. New torments assail her. She thinks of all she loves most on earth, of daughter, or if Alison were near her, she might pray for her, might scare away these frightful visions, might save her. She calls her, but she answers not. No, she is utterly abandoned of heaven and man and must perish eternally. Again, she consults the hourglass. One quarter of an hour is all that remains to her, or that she could employ it in prayer, or that she could kneel, or even weep. A large mirror hangs against the wall, and she is drawn towards it by an irresistible impulse. She sees a figure within it, but she does not know herself.
can that can Davis object within the white hair that seems newly arisen from the grave be she? It must be a phantom. No, she touches her cheek and finds these feelings. Ah, what is this red brand on her brow? It must be the seal of demon. She tries to efface it, but it will not come out. On the contrary, it becomes redder and deeper. Again, she consults glass. The sand is still running on. How many minutes remain to her? Ten, cried voice, replying to her mental agony. Ten, and turning, she perceived a familiar standing beside her. Thy time is well nigh out, Alice Nutter, he said. In ten minutes, my lord will claim thee. My compact with thy master is broken, she replied, summoning up all her resolution. I have long ceased to use the power bestowed upon me, but even if I wish it, thou hast refused to serve me. I have refused to serve you, madam, because you have disobeyed the express injunctions of my master, replied the familiar. But your apostate set does not free you from bondage. You have merely lost advantages which you might have enjoyed. If you choose to dismiss me, I could not help it. Neither I nor my lord have been to blame. We have performed our part of the contract. Why am I brought hither? demanded mistress. I will tell you, replied the familiar. You were brought here by order of the king. Your retreat was revealed to him by master parts who learnt it from Janet by the sapient sovereign intended to confront you with your daughter Alison, who, like himself, is accused of witchcraft. But he will be disappointed for when he comes to you, you will be out of the shadow. And he put his hands at the chest. Alison, accused of witchcraft, sayest thou? cried Mistress Nutter. I replied the familiar. She is suspected of bewitching Richard Asherton, who has been done to death by Janet Vice. For one so young, the little girl has certainly a rare turn for mischief, but no one will know. The real author of the crime, and Alison will suffer it. Heaven will not suffer such iniquity, said the lady. As you have nothing to do with heaven, madam, it is needless to refer to it, said Amelia. But it certainly is rather hard that one so young as Alison should perish. Can you save her? asked Mistress Nutter. Oh, yes, I could save her, but she will not let me, replied Amelia. No, no, it is impossible, cried the wretched woman. I cannot help her. Perhaps you might observe the My master, whom you accuse of harshness, is ever willing to oblige you. You have a few minutes left. Do you wish him to aid her? Command me, and I will obey you. This is some snare, thought Mistress Nutter. I will resist it. Cannot be worse off than you are, remarked the familiar. I know not that, replied the lady. What wouldst thou do? Whatever you command, madam, I can do nothing of my own accord. Shall I bring your daughter here, say so, and it shall be done? No, thou wouldst ensnare me, she replied. I well know thou hast no power over her. Thou wouldst place some phantasm before me. I will see her, but not through thy agency. She is here, cried Alison, opening the door of the closet and rushing toward her mother, who instantly locked her in her arms. Pray for me, my child, cried Mistress Nutter, mastering her emotion, or I shall be snatched from you forever. My moments are numbered. Pray, pray. Alison fell on her knees and prayed fervently. You waste your breath, cried familiar in mock tone. Never till the brand shall disappear from your brow, and the writing traced in her blood shall vanish. From this parchment, can she be saved? She is mine. Pray, Alice, pray, shrieked Mistress Nutter. I will tear her in pieces if she does not cease, cried Amelia, assuming a terrible shape, menacing her with laws like those of a wild beast. Pray, thou mother, cried Alice. I cannot, apply the lady. I will kill her if she but makes the attempt to hold the demon. But try, mother, try, cried Alice. Poor lady dropped on her knees and raised her hands in humble supplication. Heaven forgive me, she exclaimed. The demon sees our hourglass. The sand is out. The term is expired. She is mine, he cried. Clasp thy arms. Tightly round me, my child. You cannot take me from the shrieks of agonized woman. Release her, Alison, or I will slay thee. Likewise, roared the demon. Never, she replied, thou canst not overcome me. Ha, she added joyfully. The brand has disappeared from her brow, and the writing from the parchment old demon. But I will have her notwithstanding. And he plunged his claws into Alison's flesh. But her daughter held her back. Oh, hold me, my child, hold me. For I am a lost shrieks of lady. Be warned and let her go. All thy life shall pay for her. Cried the demon. My life for her. Willingly replied Alison, then take thy face, rejoined the evil spirit, placing his hand upon her heart, instantly ceased to be. Mother, thou art saved, saved, exclaimed Alison, throwing out her arm and gazing at her for an instant with a seraphic look. She fell backwards and expired. Thou art mine, roared the demon, seizing Mistress Nut by the hair and dragging her from her daughter's body to which she clung desperately. Help, help, she cried. Thou mayest call, but thy cries will be unheeded, rejoined the familiar with mocking laughter. Thou liest. False fine, said Mistress Nutter. Heaven will help me now. And as she saw the sisters, the monk stood before them. Hence, he cried with an imperious gesture to the demon. She is no longer in thy power. Hence, and with a howl of rage and disappointment, the familiar vanished. Alice Nutter continued the monk. Thy safety has been purchased at the price of thy daughter's life, but it is of little moment, for she could not have lived long. Her gentle heart was broken, and when the demon stopped it, forever he formed unintentionally a merciful that she must rest in the same grave with him she loved so well during life. This tell to those who will come to thee, and know thou art delivered from the yoke of Satan. Full 
sins, expiation has been made, but earthly justice must be satisfied, thou must pay the penalty for crimes committed in the flesh, but what thou sufferest here shall avail thee hereafter. I am content, she replied, pass the rest of thy life in penitence and prayer, be sure the moment that let nothing divert thee from it, for though free now thou wilt be subject to evil influence and temptations to the last, remember this, I will, I will, she rejoined, and now he said, kneel beside thy daughter's body and pray, I will return to thee ere many minutes be passed, one task more, and then my mission is ended.